one that the fall isn't as far as you might think you can solve a lot of problems for people when they're in trouble without them needing to go that far down it's just catching it at the right time at one point I was pers this is before the insolvency, I was personally in the red for £50,000. I don't know how I put food on the table. It's only recently that we talk about mental health. And for anyone that's ever worked in a room by themselves for any length of time, they'll know what I mean by being stuck in their own head. You don't have the people around you to bounce off of. You don't have the water cooler moments, nobody to chat to. And your mind can run away with you if you're not careful. It's Nishi here. We're a firm of accountants and business advisors and we are really passionate about helping people grow and scale their own businesses and achieve the lifestyle they deserve. To do this, we've created a series of resources on our website, unrelentingdrive.com. So once you've got a few minutes after this episode, it's definitely worth checking that out. And just a quick reminder, if you do enjoy this episode, just remember to like, share, follow and subscribe. Hello everyone, you're listening to the Unrelenting Drive podcast and today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by David Stoles. So David, um, thank you for joining us. If you could just let the audience know what you actually do. Happy to be here. Um, I do a number of things. Um, I've got a, a handful of businesses um, that I, I have at the moment, um, but I buy and sell businesses. Um, my, my own skill set is specifically within IT or IT security. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what I do from a a day to day perspective. That's absolutely amazing. So, um, and if you could um, if you could tell the story of how we actually met, like because we probably haven't known each other that long at the moment, but um, it, we seem to have a good connection. But where 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 do you first hear of me? Oh, where did I first hear of you? Um, I think. It was via a, a podcast or a video or something, something that you put out that I thought sounded quite interesting and so subscribed to. So yes, I, uh, YouTube is feeding is where I think we're at with that. Um, probably something like this. Um, I thought what you were doing there was, was, was quite good and quite interesting uh, and easily consumable. That's, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And, um, okay. Amazing. So what, what is your history? Like, how did you get up, uh, get to the point you are at now? Okay, um, so right now today, um, I have, a, as I say, a handful of businesses. Um, I ended up in this town um, principally because of a girl um, from whom I'm now very happily divorced. Um, but the less said about that, the better, I think. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I came to Northampton when I was about 22. Um, had been made, made redundant um, two or three times by that point. Um, had dropped out of a degree. Um, had done a... a, a bit of work for United Utilities in their Norwood division, um, which gave me uh, a route into, effectively, into B2B sales. Um, and they created a telecoms division, um, which is how I moved into technology. And when I came here, couldn't really find any work. Um, so made the decision that I would work for myself um, and became self-unemployed, uh, which is a term I still use to describe myself today, yeah. um, despite having several businesses, employees, that kind of thing. But the, these days, it's like, when you say you're self-unemployed, you mean it in a good way, don't you? Yes. It's yes, like you I made do. yourself redundant. Um, it's... I'm, what I'm really saying there is that when I made that decision, um, the words that I've said many times over are that if I don't get paid, it will be my fault. And sure enough, when I didn't get paid, it was my fault. Yeah. And that still holds true today. Um, everything ultimately comes down to me. Um, you can employ the best people in the world, but if something goes wrong that's out of your control or out of their control, you still have to deal with it one way or another. Exactly. Um, and that accountability is a really important part of my life. Um, uh, and the smallest thing, the biggest thing, it doesn't matter what it is, yeah. I, I will make sure one way or another, or I will say, no, I cannot do that. Um, but I probably know someone who can. No, it's a really good outlook. So uh, I, I guess like you probably just condense like what twenty years of your life into one minute. Um, uh, it's so uh, like what, what was what was the beginning of your career like? Like how did you? Um, I, I don't know if it was painful to talk about being made redundant, but you're in a very good place now. So so how, how did that happen? Like when I worked for UU, um, I was in a very good place. I'd been made redundant already. Prior to that, which I okay. ended up at UU, I didn't particularly want to do the job, but needed work as yeah. a a twenty year old kid. Um, when, when was that? Like, um, uh, so we're at what nineteen ninety eight, ninety nine. 
um, okay, yeah. um, which obviously I, I don't look like I could now be 45 years old. Um, I, I, isn't it just? <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it, it was just go and work for a company. Um, and as it turns out, they were a really good company and it was the kind of place, you, know, you, you is a, a, a globally listed business. They've got organizations all over the place. You know, um, the, the term job for life doesn't really ring true these days, but that was the kind of place where you could just jump from job to job to job for yeah. your entire career. Um, however, um, they sold that part of the business um, in Manchester, which is where I was living at the time. Um, no, no, your jobs will be fine. Yeah, it's not a problem. And then once they did it, they went, as long as you move to Ipswich, which wasn't necessarily a huge incentive for me. Um, as a 20-year-old living in Manchester with his mates. So, yeah, it's a bit um, of a downgrade, isn't yeah, it? It's... Yeah, I was still sort of living with my student friends, but had a proper working salary and a company car and those kinds of things, which when you're that age, it's kind of a little bit difficult to comprehend. Um, but then uh, 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 my my son came along, um, yeah. ended up here. How, how did you get into that job? Were you a graduate or did you... No, have... no, no, okay. no. I, 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 <laughs> I didn't necessarily drop out of university. I was... Ejected? Invited to leave is what I was going to say. But yes, effectively ejected at the end of the first year. Um, succession of not getting work in on time, ultimately. Um, I was working to to pay my rent more hours than I was spending studying. Um, so that's how it went. But I met some great people um, that I'm still friends with today, and, and I wouldn't change that for anything. If anything, um, I might even recommend it. Um, I know what some people think about going to university, but it, when you leave the town you grow up in, and that, that is the yeah. reason I went. I just needed a reason to, to leave the town that I grew up in. But I guess when you went and when I went, like tuition fees were like three or a thousand pounds a year. Yep. That's it. You know, I had a, a, a grant yep. uh, and that kind of thing. Which... Well, that's interesting though. Would you, so you still recommend that course of action to young people today, even though it costs them way Wouldn't more money? necessarily recommend it, yeah. but I might say, this is my experience and this is what I gained from it. If that's for you, then great. If it's not, that's also fine because I have a young nephew who's that age. Yeah. Um, I had exactly this conversation with him and said, look, you know, whatever you do, whether you choose to go to work or you choose to go to university and whether you go to university here or somewhere else, it will all work out because you've got your head screwed on and usually the fall isn't that far, which is a lesson I didn't learn until I had an insolvency about uh, 2008, 2009, something like that. Okay. Um, it was horrible. You didn't want to tell anyone. You felt embarrassed about it. Once you got through it and you learned some lessons, you went, actually, do you know what? Yeah. N now I've got a positive out of that and I've learned so much. And, and as it happens, it was that insolvency that helped me figure out how to buy my first business. Um, because, you know, I'd, I'd started a business in uh, 2001, 2002. So when you when you were made redundant from UU, you, you went straight into building your own business? Mm. Yeah, so came here, um, couldn't find any suitable work. And that was when I made the decision to, to work for myself. Um, and, and I did, and I was effectively selling somebody else's telecom, somebody else's IT, somebody else's connectivity, those kinds of things. So what was that business called? Uh, that was called Devlin Fisher. Devlin Fisher? Devlin Fisher, Devlin yeah. Fisher, yeah, okay. it was, um, That's an interesting name. How the four of us that got made redundant from what was Norweb within United Utilities, we, between the four of us, made the decision to start a business um, and I literally sat there and said, right, what are your mum's maiden names and middle names? So we had eight names to pick from and um, name check coming. Um, Devlin was John Gibbons' mum's maiden name and Fisher was Dave Williams' mum's maiden name. Um, after a very, very short period of time. Um, it sounds like a party game, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 it was. And, you know, they were, they, they're, they're good guys. I'm still in touch with them. There was another chap as well, Ralph. Um, Ralph was a bit older than the rest of us, um, but the, the three of them kind of very quickly dropped off it. Um, so I just ran with it myself. Um, and yeah, that, that's how it built. And then I, I met my now business partner. Um, he helped me bring some stuff in-house. He's, he's exceptionally talented when it comes to um, the technical aspect of IT. Yeah. Um, and so, so your business partner was in that business with you at the time as well? No, no, Mark wasn't, Mark wasn't in that business with me at the time but he came into the business subsequently. Yeah. 
and I met Mark um, <laughs> through his wife. Um, not don't read too much into that. Um, it was a national insurance for directors course at HMRC, okay. um, and they had a they had a business in this very building yeah. on that side of the corridor. Oh right, okay. Um, called New Advantage, um, and I sort of looked. They were doing an outsourcing yeah. sort of thing, and I sort of thought to myself, "Well, that could be a good source of leads for me. I'll go and see them." And then Mark and I just got on really well, and we ended up um, starting a business together. Um, so this is the accountant in me inquiring, like National Insurance for Directors. They had a whole course on it. Yeah. It's like, how long was the course? The one thing I remember from it, which I couldn't even tell you is whether or not it's still true. Hopefully you'll tell me the answer now. Uh, I seem to recall them telling me, make sure you only do one pay slip a year because it caps what you pay for National Insurance. Oh, it's not true because then they brought it in like a um, a portioning basis and actually the accounting firms that used to do that and then didn't stop doing it their clients got completely scro- screwed over in covid because what it yeah what it meant was um their clients can actually claim furlough um so then they end up having to go into universal credit but um so yeah th- that was a loophole that did exist now i desperately want to get into an accounting conversation <laughs> all right fine but actually it's uh it's interesting because you know hmrc do like cl- cl- closing loopholes even but um that no that's really cool so and and but when your business uh, when it went into insolvency like i guess from the timeline you've been running it for about six years at that point yeah something like that um and h- how did it happen like what what caused it yeah, so we, we got into bed with a third director, somebody from Mark's previous life um, in employment. Um, and that just ultimately went sour. Um, he put himself on a pedestal. There was fraud with Microsoft licensing, which we had to put right. Um, and it just it just went pear-shaped. So I put the business into insolvency on the basis that I wasn't going to continue to trade it. What I should have done, in hindsight, was gone through a a voluntary members or cr- creditors was, voluntary yeah, liquidation. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know anything about insolvency at that point. Um, cue the next sort of 24 months of going through lots and lots of company law and insolvency law, um, getting a little upset with some lawyers that I found ultimately I was just paying to litigate and, um, and ended up representing myself uh, and, and getting a much better outcome. Um, as it turns out, but yeah, that that whole process of insolvency, as painful as it was, um, had some valuable lessons in it. And as I say, the the, the things you learn about company law and insolvency law were very valuable. Um, and that led to me buying my first business that I was able to bolt onto what I'd restarted. If if you don't mind sharing them, what what would you say the biggest lessons you did learn from that whole insolvency process were? One that the fall isn't as far as you might think. Um, and two, you can solve a lot of problems for people um, when they're in trouble um, without them needing to go that far down. It's just catching it at the right time. Okay. Um, and as I say, that first business that, that I bought, was a, it was a turnaround. Uh, James, who I'm still friends with to this day, was introduced by a, a mutual client that we had, um, a very large shoemaking business not a million miles from here. Um and he ultimately decided that he'd had enough. Um, so I kind of knew how to fix it. Um, I never expected it to pay as quickly as it did, um, but it did. And I was like, wow, that was good. What an experience. I really enjoyed doing that. So that's really interesting. Before we go into that, though, when you say the fall isn't quite as far as you think it is, is that because you're building insolvency up to be something really dreadful in your mind, but actually it's quite a easy or straightforward process? Is that what you mean? Easy and straightforward might be um, oversimplifying it. Um, and it's probably all important to keep in mind the benefit of hindsight. Um, were you not an accountant? Um, I might say to you, what is your perception of going through an insolvency? Um, but you're going to know more than a lot of people about it. Um, but what I can tell you is when I went through it, there was a lot of fear, angst, sleepless nights. Um, at, at one point, I was pers- this is before the insolvency, I was personally in the red for £50,000. I don't know how I put food on the table. I really don't. Um, I, I sort of 
before that process, but after Mark and I had met, both of us completely independently managed to crash various motor vehicles. Um, and between us have quite the collection of skin grafts, um, which gave us a bit of a false start on that first business, Devlin Fisher. I'm assuming you like your motorbikes then. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, if you go to an insolvency, that you don't want to tell people that you've gone bust because there is a really negative perception because you're thinking I've done something badly or they're thinking I've done something badly. Um, maybe I have done something badly. Um, and there's this big long list of things that can go wrong or can feel horrible. Um, but there's another important lesson to learn there. It's that it's none of my business what anyone else thinks of me, um, which being perfectly frank, gives me license not to have to care. Um, and that is really quite freeing. Um, and that can sound a little arrogant potentially, um, but nobody really knows what's going on. It's like reading a red top paper. You see the, the headlines that sell the paper. Um, you don't really know what's going on. It's got spin, it's got twist. You have to read between the lines. And if you're not in a good place to read between the lines, you'll, you'll just take it at face value. And that's, yeah. th that, that insolvency is a negative thing. It's like getting fired from a job. Yeah. Who wants to tell anyone? Who wants to tell their friends and their loved ones that they've been fired? It's the same thing. But when you work for yourself, you're not getting fired. You've hit a point where you can't continue. And actually, there's a proper business process to deal with that. It's just that most people don't know it. Well, one of my best friends, he's also one of the most successful business owners I know. He's always like, if you get to 30 and you haven't been, you haven't been bankrupt like three times, you're not doing it right. And I was like, I can't bite my tongue on that, but I do, it worked for him. I don't think it would work for me because he's got a very different mindset. And, and I, but what do you think on that? Like it's, there, is, there are people out there, you know, there's a group who will look at insolvency as failure, but there, there's another group who will just be like, hey, it's just part of being an entrepreneur. And this is it. it it's it, it, that group that looks at it as failure Failure is okay, and I'm I'm not going to roll out a load of cliches. Um, you know, the first one that springs to mind is Edison and the light bulb. Yeah. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll go with that one. He failed however many thousand times before he got it right. But we're all sitting with light bulbs in our houses, um, and it's no different. Than anything there isn't necessarily a manual to teach you how to set up in business. You know, even if you go and do an MBA, um, a master's in business administration, doesn't necessarily how to tell you how to set up and start a business. It's hard, uh, and the way that I did it, which is different to probably most people, is I went out and I literally knocked doors and built relationships and had something of value for those people and presented it to them in a way that I thought would be sensible. And some of those people went, yes, that's great. And then some of those people, when I asked them, even if they didn't do business with me, really thankful for your time, really appreciate it. Do you happen to know anybody else that I could talk to? Um, that it might be worth me having a conversation because if I don't, I will never do business with them. And that's it. it you're just asking for a door to be opened. And that's half the battle. So is that, you started off as like a salesperson or like a sales director, really, when you set up? An independent sales agent. You could, I can call it sales director. I could call it CEO. I was the, I was the director of a limited company. Um, you and I both know um, how easy it is to go and set up a limited company on company's house. I could do my phone here now before we finish the interview. Um, but you have to know how to do it. Don't get me wrong. You can buy a square foot of land in Scotland and call yourself a baron. Precisely. Um, uh, or you can buy a star. It's... But the reality is, and again, it, it kind of harks back a little bit to the way I describe myself as being self-unemployed. You know, I, I grew up on a, a council estate. My mum was a, 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 a low-level civil servant. My dad was a painter and decorator. Um, uh, I went to a comprehensive school. I did okay in some GCSEs and scraped through. I think I ended up with one A level out of the three that I took um, because I didn't really have any direction, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, you know, my, and you've got to do something with your time. Um, so I chose to do this and I'm very happy with my choices. Um, even now today, people sort of say, oh, you can go and do what you want. You can go and live on a beach or whatever. I go, 
I quite like to go uh, to. It's... In fact, yes, you did. Didn't you? Yeah, you did say that the other week. So, um, what, what, yeah, but I think your explanation made sense, and it was. Yeah, it's. I like to go to the beach, but you know, two weeks is plenty. In fact, two weeks is probably too much for me. Um, I, I have to do something, um, and my friends, my family, my 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 links, they're all here. They're not in some lovely place in the sun that you see on Instagram. When you're having a down moment, you go, oh, I'd love to do that because that's that fraction of a second in time that sells you a story, as they say, a picture speaks a thousand words. I was, uh, you know, I'm having a bit of a chuckle because I was thinking about my last holiday and I was like, I got to the beach and I just got the best sun lounger on the beach and I, I was just sitting there. I was like, for the first half hour, I was like, that, wow, this is amazing. Then I was like, I'm kind of bored now. <laughs> what, what should I do? Um, oh, drink and listen to podcasts. And then, and then three days later, me doing that just like nonstop all day, um, I was like, I, I'm done on the beach. Yeah, agreed. Um, you know, I've just come back. Uh, I read a stack of books, but I finished the books before we were due to come back. I'm like, sort of drumming my fingers going, oh, one out. Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Unrelenting Drive podcast. I started this podcast because over the years, I've had hundreds of the most inspiring conversations of my life with small business owners, and they really helped me grow and scale my own business and get my mindset right, even when times were really tough. I wanted to capture those conversations and make them available to other small business owners who are following in my footsteps. And I've just got a small request. If you enjoy this episode, if you find it really inspiring, if you find it helps you in your own business, then please just like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. The more subscribers we get, the more we can invest in making the podcast better. So enjoy the episode. Yeah, I th- you know what, when people know you're a business owner, they've always got this fantasy built up in their mind, like, you know, you could run your business from anywhere in the world, um, until they realize you've got kids that got to go to school. And But I, I know there's all those families on YouTube where they take their kids with them and, and homeschool them. I don't know if they'd really school them, but I guess if you're if your kids are young and you show them a kangaroo in Australia, that's something most kids won't really see in this country. So it's maybe a form of schooling. But yeah, I, I think people on the outside looking in always think there's this really glamorous life to being a business owner, and uh, and it probably doesn't it doesn't turn turn out that way because you can never you can never turn off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know that 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 scenario you describe with people in a bus and their families, I think, is amazing for. You know, those kids, in the most part, although they're not getting a formal education, they're getting an incredible education. Um, and they will just function differently. And as humans, we're really adaptable. You know, if I wanted to be a gas central heating engineer, I could train for three months to do that. And I'd be able to do it because we can all do pretty well everything if we apply ourselves. Um, but that's not something I want to do. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but if I do that wrong, somebody will die. Whereas if you do IT wrong, nobody's going to die. <laughs> yeah, so, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, yeah you know, it, and it's fine. It's the, the you know it, that whole gas boiler scenario. There's a finite number of parts, and if you put them together in the right way and tick the right boxes, it will work. That that's massively over, oversimplifying it, but it's true. There's the number of variables is hugely limited. Um, but yeah, being fluid and and being able to adapt to situations is is a key thing. And those kids that are in those campers now, they'll be really good at that, I think. But they won't necessarily go into, assuming they ever did apply for a job, they don't have a CV to hand over or a set of qualifications necessarily, which is what we're brought up with, certainly here in this country. Um, you must do this and you must do that. And it's, it's convention. You and I as employers, we still both go, where's your CV? That's what I want to see. Do you meet these criteria? No, right, you're gone. Next, you're through the door, right? You've turned up, your shirt's hanging out, your shoes are filthy, the sweat rolling off you. That's a bit of, that's a big negative. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, you, you know, you st- even then you still, despite what a CV says, you never really know if someone can do the job until they've been doing the job for a period of time. Um, so you kind of, rightly or wrongly, I'll divide a CV by two the minute it lands on my on my desk because so many people lie. Are they lucky and unlucky people? This is it. You're, you're, you're well, not as lucky and unlucky. Was office, wasn't it? it's... <laughs> yeah, it's um, because so many people lie. The CVs that have come through the door and the people that I've employed that have been yeah. terrible. And you're going, you've lied. You've absolutely lied on this CV. 
you cannot do those things. Mm. The downside to that is it now negatively impacts the people that haven't lied. Um, so you, you as an employer, you, you just have to take your chance is what it amounts to. And it's, it's that responsibility and accountability thing. If I employ someone, it's down to me to get the best out of them. Hopefully they want to get the best out of themselves too. Employing people is like one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's like you've always got to find this balance between testing someone to make sure they're a good fit, but also the patients because people develop at their own rate. So, but you know, people that are slower at developing in your business, they, in the long term, they could be one of your best employees. And it's, there's no set rules. All you've got to do is just try and make sure that your own issues don't impact those people you bring into the business and you, you're not you're looking at everything from an objective point of view and also more importantly before you even do recruit a position you set the criteria for it you set the success the, the period of time you're waiting for it to be successful the you, you're really clear to the people you you bring in about the culture of your business and what's expected of them but it's I, I think the stats on it from what I've seen is like one in six people are essentially self-employed um, and then one in six of those are like business owners. So you're talking about one thirty-sixth. Am I getting that right? Yeah. One thirty-sixth of people um, out there who are really capable of employing other people. And it's 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 a very small group of people, I, I guess. But, but and, and people do it in their different ways. And there, there's no rule book on it. You know, people will be a lot of experts will say including me, I'll say, um, build a culture, write that culture down. It's not fair to hold people accountable to a culture if it's not written down, if it hasn't been communicated with them. That'll get you so far. It can be difficult to get through the lies on a CV, um, but then there's things in your culture you can test, especially on the integrity side, which will help you understand um, that maybe it, it, how accurate that CV actually was. But it's, yeah, there's no, there's no easy answer there. So, and I, you know what, one of the saddest things, but actually I'd call it Darwinism is the amount of business owners who wanted to grow and scale a business and then they start hiring and then they're like, Hey, I love being self-employed. Uh, literally like six months later after they'd just been through that like whirlwind of, um, hiring the wrong people, making the wrong decisions. But you know what? The other side is it doesn't matter how good you get at hiring. It, uh, you're always only ever going to have in my opinion, a 50-50 chance. You can do everything right and um, and something outside of your control, maybe in that other person's life, will will take over and and make it not succeed. But um, all, the other side is, like one thing I've realized is wh when I want to maintain the mo motivation to keep hiring, I think about all the team members that have been successful and I, I think about why they were successful. I, may, I think about how it made me feel like there was pride in it. There was um, there was a fulfillment in it because I'd, I'd made a difference to someone else's life. But also, um, and also, there's money in it, right? When when an employee works, you as a business, you make more money, and and everyone gets more money. So that that can also be motivated too. But I, I absolutely know what you mean. There's there's so many of those people. Yeah, it it certainly keeps things interesting. Yeah, Dave. So. Uh, Apologies if we've already covered it, um, but so you, you had the insolvency. What did you do exactly after the insolvency? So when I decided that I was going to close it, I started another business. So that first business was heavily biased towards on-premises telecoms and IT. Okay. You'd put in boxes, you'd put boxes on walls, that kind of thing. Um, and it's just as the cloud was getting going. So I started a new separate business doing cloud services. And I, I built that one um, to where it is today. Well, wow, amazing. Okay. And so that would, how long ago did you start that? It was 2006. So the first, the first inception, Devlin Fisher was 2002-ish. Um, then what was Infologic Telecom was 2010-ish. Um, Company's House will give us the answers there. Um <laughs> Uh, and that's now recently become tech logic um, to sort of more accurately represent the way its services are consumed by businesses. Um, but yeah, along the way, it was where I acquired a couple of businesses that bolted into what's now tech logic. Um, as I say, the first one was a turnaround. 
And did, you have, did you have to pay a fortune for those domains? Uh, no, not not so much. Um, it, it's you can sort of one of the reasons why I've just changed from Infologic Telecom was because there's a surprising number of Infologics out there. All right. Um, <laughs> um, and quite close to, so I, I was just sick of that. So, yeah, Technologic was a, a much simpler one um, uh, and surprisingly easy to get hold of and helped decide what to call the company. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah. The main off, often drives the name of the company. Yeah, yes. indeed. So, so, yeah, over the course of the years, that's built and it's, it runs largely by itself. Um, but there's been a, a number of businesses that Mark and I have acquired in recent years uh, in the last 12 months, there's been an exit from a recruitment business in the Northwest, uh, an exit from a lighting manufacturer in the Southwest. Um, we've got a print business in the South. Uh, there was a shoe business not a million miles from here that unfortunately went to the wall and we were too late on that one. Um, and one that I've still got at the moment is a is a Ford dealership, um, which is running nicely. Yeah, you're telling me about that Ford dealership because you... you... You mentioned the person who was exiting the business, the old owner, like ev every decision ran through him. And you, you were telling me about how you had to reconfigure the way like people in the business made decisions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that one came about because that car dealership was a customer of Technologic um, and still is. Um, and I, I'd assume so. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you would have fired yourself. <laughs> um, and Bob wanted to retire he'd been there for 50 years um he was well overdue retirement and we had talked about it prior to covid um somewhat predictably it didn't go anywhere as soon as that bit down um i was like that's not really for me right now but i felt that because i knew although i've got had zero interest in running a car dealership and it was somewhat outside of my usual parameters for an acquisition um because of the way i'd used the business as a as a customer the way I knew the business as a supplier and how long I'd had a relationship with them. I felt that something could be done and, and the, the four managers that that, are, that were there and are still there um, have been there for years and know exactly what they're doing. Um, but as you rightly say, every decision used to run through the old owner. Um, so culturally, that needed a little bit of shifting. So it's about just helping the four of them work together as a team, as a leadership team, and have a decision making process. Yeah. How many people do they have under them? So there's about uh, 15, 15 people there all together. Give one take. five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's giving them a, a, a means and helping them understand that sometimes when they make a decision, they go through a door and they might find that it's the wrong decision, but also it's a two way door. So it's about what you do when it's the wrong decision and how to deal with it and how to keep each other accountable and encouraging them to challenge each other. And challenging each other not in a you've done that wrong it's a that seems wrong to me but maybe i'm misunderstanding could you explain it to me again and one of two things happens yeah. either the person that's asked a question learns something new or the person that did it and is explaining it learns something new and they go oh yeah you're right about that actually i could do it like this um and, and so on so that's been really helpful um i still go down there sort of once a week once a fortnight yeah. um Again, because culturally they were so used to having somebody there all the time. Um, and it, it's really to sort of appease that. Um, but yeah, it, it runs and does exactly what it's supposed to do. So the, have you got four businesses at the moment? Like, um, one, two, three, four, yes. And how how do you find like, I'd, I'd, like running one business is hard, but I, I guess are you really, do you consider yourself as running the other businesses or are you overseeing them or? No, um, it, it's a, an investor shareholder mentality i think it's probably the best way to put it um you know if you if you buy shares through your isa for example yeah. you don't rock up and say right we're buying pens from here today um you 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 wait for your dividend yeah. <laughs> that's it and depending on how many of those shares you own um decides how much input you can have on that business so mm -hmm in terms of a say a hostile takeover yeah. you know if you're all being a board member you need to hold a lot of shares um to be able to do something to make a change but in terms of the way we buy our shares for our pensions or through our savings or whatever it might be you're you're 
you've got no involvement, you can't do anything. Yes, you can go to shareholders meetings and see reports, and most of that stuff's publicly available anyway. Um, but when you're dealing with small businesses, you can actually do something and see a return and have a real effect. Um, and that's that's the sort of thing that I enjoy doing. Um, you know, I, I'm always actively seeking an acquisition um, because it's a really enjoyable process. Yeah. And I sort of alluded to the first one being a turnaround. The next one was a more conventional purchase. Um, the one we've just been talking about was a very conventional purchase. Uh, and people quite often think that there's a huge pile of cash sitting there doing nothing. And that's how you buy a business. And that's just not how you buy a business. Even when you see this stuff in the press about these huge corporates, that's just not how it works. You're usually talking talking about massively leveraged finance or, or um, corporate investors that really are taking a pound of flesh. And we start getting into things like internal rates of return, which I'm not going to go into now um, because the the math is difficult, um, but it's entirely understandable. I guess... Um... That makes a lot of sense. Like when you when you take over a business, is that the right term? I, I guess yeah. Um, do do you appoint like one general manager, or do you do you appoint multiple managers? Or because you you mentioned the Ford garage, um, they already had a leadership team there. But is there one person you appoint as a leader above all the other leaders? One person that's ultimately accountable. Um, in this instance, um. That, that particular instance, that leadership team, are uh, I'm shaping them to work differently. And it might ultimately be the case that I sell that business back to those people. So they need to be able to run that as directors. And they've always only ever been employees. So similarly to the insolvency scenario earlier, um, when you become a director, it's just a, a word on paper. Um, a cursory search on the internet will help you understand what you have to do with a business to be a director. Um, we're not going to get into that now, obviously. Um, but it, it's not ultimately that difficult. You're you're talking about compliance in the most part. Um, it's like a regulated industry. Compliance is there usually for a good reason. Um, it's to keep things in check and between the lines where they're supposed to be. Um, but some businesses, you know, they, they might have a general manager, this particular one doesn't have a general manager. And in part, because I'm still going there once a week, once a fortnight, I'm still accountable. I'm the shareholder. I am still accountable, ultimately. Um, if they do something wrong, it still comes back. Even if I were to fire them for some reason, um, it still comes back to me. I've got to deal with it. I'm the shareholder. Um, and I'm currently listed as the director on that business. And is that kind of how you started with the other three businesses? So, sorry, other two businesses that you currently own, because you would have plus Technologic. Because did you did were you the the general manager or the managing director essentially, and then eventually you would have stepped away from that position and promoted someone within that business up? Or that's that's kind of how you do it. It, it, it ultimately depends. There isn't a, a hard and fast answer to it. it. It depends on the shape and size of the business, how it operates. Sometimes there's an ideal candidate for that role. Sometimes the seller will stay yeah. and you're going, okay, fine. Um, and they need a different kind of support and you can help them manage it properly. And they've got all the relationships and you're going, okay, we'll stay then. We'll buy this. We'll fix it. We'll, we'll solve the cash flow problems. Um, uh, which as with anything, if you do it often enough, it becomes easier and you pick up what the tools are and how you can use those tools to, to get that job done. Okay, amazing. So, and how many times would you say you've done it so far in terms of businesses? Because have you sold any of the businesses that you bought? Yeah, as I was saying, we exited two last year. Oh, yeah, okay. Or in the last yeah. 12 months, rather. Yeah, amazing. Okay. So, uh, in total, probably a dozen times, give or take. Oh, wow, okay. Um, some of them haven't worked out. Um, yeah. Yeah, as I say, one of them went to the wall, um, and there's, there's, there's a handful of others as well. Um, but you, you just keep chipping away. You have to keep the wheels turning. You have to do something with your time and you meet some really interesting people, um, and yeah. you really get to know them, um, and what, what makes them tick and what they really do want to do. Um, you also meet the ones that really don't know what they want to do. Um, 
and to that end, it, it's it's kind of a little bit like me saying, I don't have a particular interest in disappearing off to the sun um, because you, you you can get stuck in your own head. Um, you know, it, it's only recently that we talk about mental health and for anyone that's ever worked in a room by themselves for any length of time, they'll know what I mean by being stuck in their own head. You don't have the people around you to bounce off of. You don't have the water cooler moments, nobody to chat to. And your mind can run away with you if you're not careful. Um, yeah. uh, and I've, I've got friends who have sold businesses for extraordinary amounts of money. Mm. And they, they've had exactly that. They've described exactly those symptoms, if you will, um, even though they're in a position to, to do whatever they want, whenever they want, for as long as they want. Um, it's quite incredible. Um, and actually working for a living it's quite a good thing. <laughs> um, it works well for people, in my view. Um, it keeps them busy. It keeps them talking to other people. Um, it gives them uh, stuff to talk about, stuff to do. Uh, and that's all good. I come across so many people and they're like, they talk about how they're looking forward to retirement or they're looking, well, yeah, people that are looking forward to retirement. And it, it just makes me a bit feel a bit sad because all that tells me is they're doing something that they want to retire from. And yeah, so it's and maybe some people don't realise there's a better way. Like you know, there, there are other things they can do, but actually, like that's probably the majority of people I talk about. They're like, and yeah, I I think people just got to understand you got to you got to find something you want to do that you can never you never want to retire from. But also the other side of that is when you do want a break in your life, you have got to run your business in a way where you it can release you for that break, so you can then come back a bit later. Yeah, and that's it. That's that's kind of. You know, one one might argue that I'm in part semi-retired. Um, Mark, my business partner, lives abroad now. Um, okay. We can do what we need to do the way we need to do it without too much trouble. Um, and the things that I enjoy doing are, are running motorbikes and driving old cars, and yeah. I'm going to do that sometimes. Skin crafts. Yeah, against skin crafts. Yeah. yeah. Skin crafts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on a day like today, that's ideal, um, um, as it was yesterday. Um, but equally there's still stuff to be done um and it'll get done and you, you just sort of tick those boxes uh, and fit around your family commitments and, and and all those sorts of things that you want to do yeah absolutely yeah i do uh i think for me uh, hopefully my wife isn't watching this she, she never takes an interest in the cast but um like yeah for me because pretty much every minute of my weekend is like taking up with family stuff and, and looking after kids and stuff like being able to just take a slightly longer lunch um during the work week a lot of the time that's um that's pretty much the only me time i get and i, I kind of think if i was still in employment and i couldn't do that i i don't actually know how to cope from like the the day-to-day -day of having two young kids and so i think that's something to be grateful for when you actually do run a business um being able to do that but um so you that's really cool. Um, do you, is is Tech Logic the your forever company, and then I guess all the other businesses that you buy and may eventually sell will be uh, they're kind of they're separate from that. Is is that how you look at it? Um, probably not. I do have more of an emotional attachment to it because it's, I suppose, fundamentally the one that I first started. Um, so there is that emotional attachment, which is something that you find. When you buy businesses, a lot of the people do have an emotional attachment and they want to know that their staff are going to be looked after, that their customers are going to be looked after, yeah. that there will still be something of them within the business um, because they've worked really hard um, to get it to that point. And most of the time, that's kind of not too difficult to do. Um, that that first one, I, to, sorry to harp on about it, but we you know we kept the employees. Um, they wanted to stay. It was a bit of a travel for them, yeah. um, but they stayed um, for a long time. Um, and that's, I think that's a good thing. I, I like that. Um, but you can never say never. Um, the kind of business that TechLogic is, you get inquiries about potential acquisition quite frequently. Um, I imagine it's so a recurring income. income. Exactly. Um, recurring income. It's not seasonal. Um, it, it, you know, the contracts tend to be long-standing, um, and that's just the way the industry is at the moment. Um, so, and I imagine it's similar for for the accountancy industry. 
Yeah, we. I mean, I, I get people contacting me all the time, but the the other side of that is they probably they're. I know there's averages for the industry, but I don't want to build an average business, so I don't want to. I don't want to sell out for averages. But the other side of it is, um, and accounting is it, it's essentially what I do. It's it, it, at the moment it's my identity. One day it might not be. But um, it it gives me it gets me into all the conversations I want to have with people. It gets me talking about the right the things I want to talk about. Um, it gives me a platform to actually really support businesses because whatever I do, I, I know I can't really imagine doing anything that's not business related. So it's it, it's very in the end of the day, I, you can get that quick win just by selling out and then starting over, but. The the other side of it is I can I can definitely see the long term gain. I never get to a point where I'm completely fed up. I I mean, in my industry, a lot of people are getting really fed up, like accounting. The amount of COVID plus all the new accounting changes that the government's bringing in, you I understand why people are retiring early. Um, but the other side of it is actually like in the end of the day we we can deal with those changes all it is is another barrier to entry all we need to make sure is if we're limited and and most accountants i know now are very limited to the amount of work they can do so before when it was like get as many clients as you can it absolutely isn't anymore you've got to, you've got to find and pick the right people mm -hmm. and um and and you know as much as you're selling to a client they're they've got to sell themselves to you at the same time because actually um for the constraint in our industry now is staff it's not it's not clients, but that doesn't mean clients aren't important. Like, you know, we make a commitment to supporting them and we'll do the very best of our abilities to the highest standards. And that that's always something we're passionate about. But actually, like, the world's changing now and now we've got a limited number of people with support. So it's very important we support the right people in the right way, in a productive way. Um, cut out the bits that aren't adding value to people um, and, and bring in more of the stuff that is. And and that that's it. So while a lot of accountants are selling out, and those clients have been consolidated into giant firms that are doubling the price but doing even less work, we we've kind of gone down another route, saying, okay, well, if we could only help a hundred businesses, um, bear in mind, like you know, a couple of years back, we worked with about 190 clients, and we we changed our model to work with less clients but to do a lot more for them. But um, if we if we're rationed to the number of people that we can work with, let's work with the people that make us feel good about working with them. Let's work with the people that will actually take action um, off the back of our advice, and um, let's work for the with the people that are working for themselves for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something we've really moved towards o over the last few years. Um, but I, yeah, for me, selling out at the moment, I, I, selling out is not the right way to put it. I know, like, there's a lot of people who exit it's, for the right reasons, yeah, but it's it's fine. Um, and it's it touches a little bit on what we talked about earlier because, you know, I still pay into a pension, for example. Um, it's tax efficient. It's a sensible thing to do. Um, but as long as I keep paying into a pension, at some point, it's going to reach a stage whereby I will need to sell a business for less. Those things will, will intersect and, I, and that will make it easier to sell the business. So then I need to just pick the person I want to sell it to um, because, well, for the reasons that I said before, I've no, there's no doubt in my mind that I will be that same slightly emotional person that goes, I've worked with all these people for all these years. Um, I want to make sure they're looked after. I know most of these customers and clients really, really well. I want them to be looked after and so on and so forth. So it's got to go to the, the, the right pair of hands, which is in the cases of the acquisitions I've made, it is, is what's happened ultimately. Um, we've been able to do that and, and give them the confidence that their business will will continue and will grow and, and will will take the best bits from, from the businesses and put them together, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it, it's... You know, if you sell a business today and you go, okay, you know, I'm sitting on a hundred thousand pounds, a hundred million pounds, you're going to go, right, how long is that going to last me? So I've got a number of years on you, I suspect. So, um, one might argue, one might argue that I need less money because I won't be around for as long as you. Um, but the flip side is you go, okay, well, if you get a big sum of money, it comes back to what we talked about earlier, where you can, you don't have anything to do. You find that you've been on 
as many holidays as you want to take. You've played as much golf as you want to play. You've bought as many nice shoes as you want. Whatever the thing is, and you go, right, what's next? I can keep eating cake, but I'm going to go to an earlier grave still. Um, and I do like cake, and you can find cake, different types of cake in all sorts of places. But you, you, there's just a limit to everything. So you have to find the new thing and, and, and have that plan. And if that's, you know, your kids are young. Let's say you, you get a check for whatever the number is, and they want you to work eight hours a week to advise and manage relationships. You're great. I can, uh, my kids are young. They are hard work. There is hard. For me, the hardest thing I've ever done is try and raise kids rather than employ people. That's probably the second hardest thing. Um, but, you know, you might, you might be the kind of person that can really, that wants to and can do that kind of thing. Um, and you go, okay, brilliant. We can do all sorts of things and we can put our kids in a bus and travel the world, educate them privately uh, in a bus, wherever it might be. It gives you choices, that much is for sure. But it's important to bear in mind that if you've had a lifetime of, or if one has had a lifetime of going to work every day at more or less the same time, doing more or less the same things, that that huge culture change is a really, really difficult thing to do. And I've I've had my moments where I've struggled, where I'm going, what do I do? I don't have to do anything now. What am I going to do? Um, and you still have those moments occasionally, you know, if the weather's terrible and there's, there's nobody home and your friends are working um, because they're in employment or, or they're at different stages with their businesses or they're too far away, whatever the thing is that that's, you're going, I'm no different from anyone else. And I don't think, I never thought that I am, but now I'm stuck here watching daytime TV and it's rubbish um, because I just don't feel like reading a book or learning how to do that thing. I just want to, Mm, whatever mm, is and that's okay but just be mindful of it yeah absolutely that that makes a lot that's just an opinion which you're welcome to put in the bin or you, you know what M- most like business owners that have built their businesses up that i talk to they, they say very similar things i've got a client he he talks about do you want to be a turkey or a cheetah and he's like, the turkeys get fattened up but um, and then killed for Christmas where the cheetah's always hungry. They're, they're always looking for the next meal. And um, some people do want to be the turkey. Um, other, but actually, like, business owners are who they are because they were the cheetah. And it's very difficult from being a turkey, going from being a cheetah to a turkey, I guess. There's probably a nicer way to say this, but... It's fine. I, I get it. And it's, for, for me at least, it's just about making progress. Um, I'm quite anal about measuring my own performance in terms of something like net worth, for example, which is an easy, relatively easy one to figure out. Um, But I go, right, this year I measure it every month. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I go, right, where was I last year? Where am I going to be next year and the year after and the year after that? In fact, it looks very much like your 36 month cash flows that you do. Um, I do like a spreadsheet. we use a great bit of software called Float, actually, so it saves us loads of time, yeah. and we pass the savings on to our clients. I, I, I like to do the manual work and the sums on the spreadsheet. It's just something I like to do. Um, <laughs> um, and, and it's, yeah, as long as I'm making progress, I, I'm, I'm happy. You know, I, I get to choose which expensive cup of coffee I buy. I've got clothes on my back. Um, I don't really have anything to complain about. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm a white middle-aged man. I can complain like you wouldn't believe, and I do, but I don't really have anything to complain about. So you do it for fun. I do do it for fun. It entertains me and annoys everyone around me. Yeah, I, I can. Um, no, I mean, I, I understand. Like sometimes, if you've got nothing else to do, have a have a whinge. That's good. Um, but no, it's. Uh, but in the end of the day, like, you know, most of the conversations I've seen you have been incredibly productive. I've seen you support people. I've seen you motivate people. Like, um, we're in the same B&I group, so I could, I could see the role you play in, in that group. And um, and uh, I guess it, it's quite inspiring to a lot of people. I, I guess, actually, if... Um, well, I, you know what? If I'd say if it was me five years ago talking to you, you know how inspired would I be but actually I don't need to think about me five years ago you like you're you're still like 10 years ahead of where I am now 
So in fact, it's uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's amazing because one of the things we're always talking to business owners about is look, you love working your business, but build a business you can sell one day. Because the, the paradox of building a business you can sell is that you don't want to sell it because it's so easy to run. And um, and a lot of people I talk to, they'll say, this idea of selling a business, it's a fantasy. It's like a unicorn. It's, it's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And it's just like, but you're you're sitting there saying you bought and sold 12 businesses or, well, not sold 12, right? But you bought and sold some of 12. Yeah. And you make a really good point in that People are so involved with them, they don't know how to move them on. They have a lot of people, for example, think, oh, I'll pass it on to my kids, they'll do it. But their kids don't want to do it. Yeah. They, they're they not interested. Because those kids have seen how stressed you are for the last 20 years coming home from work. and Yeah, and you just get some of those that do that, that, that take it on and then ruin it or the parent can't let go and interferes and doesn't let them broaden out and do what they're capable of doing and make some mistakes and learn you learn from mistakes mistakes are a good thing as long as you say i've done this it's wrong this is what i'm doing about it is that okay and you're gonna get one or two answers aren't you and if the answer's no you go all right what can we do differently then you make progress with everything you do and yeah a lot of these businesses not irrespective of their industry but in a lot of cases you can successfully move them on uh, and give people a sensible exit that that they're happy with that means they can go and do whatever the thing is that they want to do i I guess all the skills that helped you build the business aren't the skills that are going to help you exit it and that's why you need to have the right people coming in and the right people to talk to some of them yes but you're probably right not all of them but some of them you, you, you can apply really well. Um, yeah. And rightly or wrongly, I'm going to argue that buying a business is actually a sales process. Um, I won't get into that. I'll just oh. leave that as a, as a thought. It's interesting um, that you say that because the book, a client of ours, um, Mark, he gave me a book by Jonathan Jay about buying and selling businesses. Yeah. I think, yeah, you mentioned, yes, yeah, so Jonathan Jay is um, like, He's one of the experts in terms of how how you buy and sell businesses, and he talks about um, always having seven on the go and having like a capital event once a year, making sure you get paid ten grand a month from each one, and um, and then continue buying a new business every year. So it's almost like a portfolio that people are recycling. And what one of the things he does talk about is yeah, it, buying the business is a selling because the, the person leaving or exiting the business you it's it's not a transaction for them and that's where most people buying or selling a business go wrong they they view it as a transaction actually first thing you got to do is just acknowledge that that person's done a good job in getting it to where it is yeah. and in fact you know if you from the stats i've seen if you sell your business you're in the top 0.5% of businesses essentially most businesses will never sell but i'm sure it's including all the self employed people and all that kind of stuff yeah. too but they they just they don't have it. They end up not having a home to go to because somebody has given a seller an inflate, a massively inflated mm. uh, view of what their business is worth. Yeah. Um, I've, as I say, you get to speak to and meet a lot of people. Um, and there was one business, uh, a scaffolding business, who firmly believed that his business was worth a multiplier of twelve times his revenue. Um, right which was a a fun conversation. We did eventually get to a point where he understood yeah. broadly why it doesn't work like that. Um, and it's not that complicated, but that was just in his head as a, as a, a stake in the ground and that was it. And I would argue that there's not many people out there that wouldn't sell their businesses for 12 times their annual revenue um, if, if there was money on the table. Um, you talk about multipliers of businesses and you know if you if your business is liquid i.e listed then the multiplier is going to be higher because it's liquid yeah. but there's 90 percent of the population the adult population in this country is employed by small businesses yeah. like yours like mine it's not liquid it's privately owned um it doesn't work like that there's a lot more to consider the risk is much higher it's why your business my business is not traded on the inter- on the um stock exchange but it doesn't mean you can't get to that point. Davis, it sounds like you've learned you've learned multiple lessons over this career. So 
you're you're a business owner you run a business uh, tech logic but then you're also an investor and you buy and sell businesses and you go in and turn them around sometimes it doesn't work but most of the time it does work which means you found a formula um so if you if you, if i could ask you two more questions before we wrap this up then yeah so what's what's next for tech logic what's next for tech logic or for you even it's- um I quite like to acquire um, some more technology businesses um, over the next year or two. Um, I think that's what technology needs now. Um, and are you so? And when you acquire businesses, do you look at how they interlink and how they support each other, or are you going down a more random route and just saying, "Hey, that business looks good. I'm just going to bring it in." It's a little bit of both. Um, so sometimes things will just be presented in front of you. Um, and because somebody knows that I've got a, a a car dealership, I've had another one presented to me that I'm looking at at the moment. Um, it doesn't quite fit with my view. So in terms of culture or operations? A, a number of different things, um, a bit of both, um, being perfectly frank. And this is what you find. You, you, you don't get squares with square holes. You, you get lots of different things or you get lots of different shapes that will fit to the square and sometimes you've got to chop chop and change. Um, so people get to know you, they get to find these things out, they realise some of the stuff you've done or what your experience is yeah. and they will it will just land in your lap and you go, okay, well, we'll look at that. Um, and I've just recently missed out on one that's at least verbally closed but then fell through um, when it came to paperwork, which was a... a I'll call it an IT security business that was uh, a Franco-American um, uh, IT business, uh, IT security business, um, which again was slightly outside of what I would normally look at, but it had certain things that made it go, yes, we'll do that deal, um, which ultimately fell through, um, which I was a bit disappointed about. Everyone said that was only a, a month or two back. Um, but it, it, it would have been a nice one to have. It was recurring revenue. Um, the things that I didn't like, it would have meant, this is going to sound a bit daft, would have meant frequent travel to France and the US. Okay. Um, yeah. Or rather more frequent than I currently do, yeah. um, which doesn't fit with my day-to-day life. Uh, yeah, because then, then you've got additional commitments. But the person yeah. that brought it to me between us, we we figured a way to, to, to make it work. Okay. Um, but in the end, the, the sellers went, Oh, do you know what? We're going to sit tight. Actually, we're not doing anything. How, how do you find businesses for sale? Do you like have relationships with brokers? Definitely not. Okay. Do you just Google business for sale? No. Um, most of the time, the businesses are not for sale. Okay. Um, they've typically got some sort of problem or other that needs to be solved, and that problem you can visibly ex- it's externally visible. Yeah. Yeah, it's that. I suppose it's that fresh pair of eyes. Sometimes, yeah. Once you get, it's like anything. You you go if you're if you if you work in IT or you work in accountancy, you walk through the door. You you already know eighty percent of what you're going to be looking at. It's figuring out that other twenty percent yeah. that makes them different. But how how would it? What would the indicators be like? What would you, as someone who doesn't know a business, how would you get to the point you're asking them if it's for sale? Like, do you see something in that business in the way it's run? which indicates actually the person might want to exit? It usually comes out in conversation. Um, I talked about overinflated values. Um, yeah. When they're for sale, they're usually with an agent. Um, that agent will quite often, not always, but quite often, and it gives the that part of the industry a bad name, write uh, 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 an MI, um, uh, an IM rather, um, and um, it will have projected figures on it mm. that contain a number of things that they wish they hadn't done in the business that make it more profitable, yeah. that carries a multiplier similar to that of a listed business, mm. even though the revenues are £500,000, £5 million, whatever it might be. And you're going, no, you, you can't, and it just, it doesn't, so a lot of the agents, they, I mean, that that's a problem with the industry in general, isn't it? Because they get paid like a monthly retainer, exactly. regardless of if they sell the business or not. So they, they go in with the highest valuation. The business owner picks the agent with the highest valuation. 
and then pays them that monthly retainer for a period of two years. And I'm in I'm in danger of upsetting a lot of people here. Okay. Um, they're, they're not all like that. No. Um, but if you take um, lawyers, for example, important to point out that I have several friends, good friends that are lawyers. However, um, if I have a dis- if you and I have a disagreement, yeah. um, and we can't work it out, and a lawyer comes along and says, "Okay, well, I'll represent you to the best of my ability, taking all the emotion out of it and working only with the facts." And you go, oh, "Well, that sounds like a good idea." Yeah. It's part of the reason why I also don't use lawyers for the businesses that I bought. Never once have I used a lawyer. Okay. Um, and then you get a lawyer on the other side who says the same thing, and they go like this. This isn't. This is very visual now, so apologies to anyone that's listening. They just butt heads and they can't make any progress yeah. because they, they they can't reach an so agreement. Paid. It's not conducive to reaching an agreement, and they still get paid. Yeah. And it takes value out of business deals when you're buying businesses. How do you buy business without like without an, a solicitor. Like, do you just have your own contracts that you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the simpler the better in general. So you've got your own templates and you write them yourself. You you write a sensible heads of terms that people agree to. You you write a shareholder agreement if they're staying or whoever else is involved. Yeah. Again, you've got a number of variables. So you're, um, to use the, the old Bruce Lee analogy, it's it's about being fluid and and fitting the space sensibly. And if there's if there's if there's too much fluid to fit in to the cup, it'll overflow and it won't work. But if you put the right amount in, you get the right, right amount out. That's amazing. And yeah. ideally, don't spill any. Yeah, so I think I said I've got two more questions and I'll ask you three. But I'd like the final question then. Um, that's absolutely amazing. So it sounds like you've had like a career packed full of like experiences. And uh, if you if you could summarize probably the most important lesson you've learned along the way um, for anyone listening in who's maybe like 10 years behind you and wants to follow, follow in those footsteps, what would you say it is? Common sense, perseverance, thick skin, um, and the application of your own circumstances. You know, you will never know if you can do it or not. Um, no amount of writing it down on paper will tell you, but you can give yourself a better chance by thinking about it rationally and talking to people that will give you perspective. Okay. That's amazing. Okay. Well, David, thank you very much. So everyone, um, you've been listening to the Unrelenting Drive podcast. Um, Keep an eye out for our future episodes. And uh, David, thank you very much for joining us. You've been absolutely amazing. This is a very insightful episode. Been a pleasure. Thanks, Lishy.